From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. On this episode of Fragmented, we're going to talk about item number 17 from the Effective Java series. Now, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time on this journey, Kaushik and I have a goal of completing all of the items in the Effective Java series book. And as you can guess it, right now we're on item 17, and we have done 16 other items on previous episodes here of Fragmented. If you're interested in catching up, please go back and listen to the other episodes. You can check those out on fragmentedpodcast.com. Click on the episodes link, and you can actually see all the various different fragmenteds for, uh, listed there. So let's hop directly into it today. Item number 17 from the Effective Java series states, design and document for inheritance or else prohibit it. Now this is actually going to be a fairly short one today. And what this basically means is, if you're designing a class for inheritance, then you need to document all the possible use cases of overriding various different methods, maybe what the return value should be, how things are implemented, if the calling method is overriding something else and calling into a various different other parts of some other object, etc., and so forth. Now, what this really means is if you are developing a class, maybe you'd like to develop libraries or a service class inside of your application that's going to be used with other teams in your company, or maybe it's even an open source library you're releasing, or you perhaps maybe work on a on an operating system very similar to Android, or you forked Android, and you're developing a particular component that you expect to be inherited from. Now, in this case, you need to make sure that you're designing it properly and documenting it properly. So first off, we want to make sure that we're documenting all of the overridable methods and kind of how the self-use of those methods is used. Meaning that this method, let's say it returns a return code and it's going to be, if it's zero, then everything is good. If it's one, then we had a, a positive use case. And if it's negative, then there's some type of other use case that happened. Now you need to make sure that you're documenting that. So if folks decide to override this method and provide their own implementation, that you let them know, hey, if you want this method to succeed, return a zero. If it was a positive success or whatever, it's a positive number greater than zero. And if it's an error, it's maybe less than zero. And you want to return that, make sure that folks know that as well. Now, this is really important because if you're just creating a class and using the whole nomenclature of, well, the code is a documentation, I understand that. But if this is going to be consumed by other people, documentation is key. How many times have you been to a GitHub library or GitHub repository, found this awesome utility or someone has told you about it, this library, and you go check it out and you start using it and realize, wow, the documentation on this thing really stinks. This is a very common problem that we have in software. And the best way to kind of get around this is provide good documentation, especially if your class you're building is going to be overridable. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you're building your class for inheritance. Now, a lot of these classes in Android have been built for inheritance, such as you know, all the different view classes are mainly all you know open. You can go ahead and subclass them. This is how we create custom views. There's tons of other classes inside of Android, but the custom view one is probably very prevalent that most of us have dealt with. You want to create a custom layout, you extend maybe linear layout or relative or whatever, maybe view group, and you implement your own different type of view. Now, thankfully, the folks on the Android team have done a very good job of actually documenting the use cases of all the overridable methods. And that's what this item number 17 is stating. Provide good documentation stating what happens. So maybe if I call into this method and I'm overriding it, and maybe I'm calling the super class, I should know if I'm going to be interacting with any static member variables. If, I, if anything is asynchronous, are we going to be working on a different thread? All those types of things need to be mentioned in the documentation. Hey, is this call even thread safe at all? These things need to be documented so folks can actually implement these properly. The one of the things that this item number 17 does kind of violate is there is, it's been stated that a good API documentation shouldn't describe what a given method does. Uh, excuse me, it should describe what a given method does, not how it does it. And here we're, we're basically saying, hey, look, document how this, how these things happen. And this is one of those unfortunate consequences in the fact that inheritance violates encapsulation. And this is directly from the Effective Java chapter here. So if we do design this way, we need to make sure that we're letting folks know how things are happening inside of 
those methods because folks are going to be using these methods and overriding them and providing their own implementation. For example, if we didn't have the documentation on how on draw worked or how on measure worked or anything like that inside of the Android framework, well, we would be kind of blind understanding what happens. And for those of you that were very early on in the Android ecosystem, such as myself, you'll remember that there was a lot of use cases in which the Android documentation was not fully fleshed out. It was a very new platform. They were just going as fast as they could. We kind of had to hop into the source code and learn, and those things changed from release to release, which brings up another good point. You need to make sure that as you're changing this, you're updating your documentation, because if people are going to be consuming this and overrunning your methods, make sure that the documentation is also updated as well. And make sure you're telling them how things are happening underneath the hood. One of the other things that Item 17 talks about is When you're writing a class that's built for inheritance, you need to make sure that you are testing it. Well, how do you test this? The best way to test a class built for inheritance is to actually write a subclass for it and test that subclass. What this will do is automatically show you, hey, oops, I didn't make sure that this method was open enough so we could actually override it. This one needs to be overridable. It wasn't before. Great. We can fix that. It'll also show you if a method that you have made open for overriding should not be made for overriding. It's something that maybe isn't used all the time. Maybe you're never over overriding it. You find that there's no need to. Well, then at that point, you can kind of tighten that method down and provide some access modifiers on that. So if you don't need it, again, if you're designing it, you know what you should be open and shouldn't be open, but there's always those weird edge cases where you may not understand or completely feel like you should open these things up. You may start with it open, do some testing or whatever. But again, the best way to do this is to write a subclass for it because that's what you're writing your class for. You know, if imagine writing the view group class and not writing a, a subclass of it. Well, that had to be done for linear layout and relative layout and all the other Android layouts and things that we've used. But if you design your own class and you never were to subclass it, well, then how do you know you've really built it correctly? So again, write a subclass for any class that you built that's for inheritance. Furthermore, we're going to dig into this a little bit deeper here, is one of the things item 17 states is there's a few restrictions that a class must obey when building for inheritance. And one of those is constructors must not invoke overridable methods. Uh, now, if you violate this rule, various different program failures can result. Um, the superclass constructor runs before all the other subclass constructors, so overriding methods and so forth, things kind of start getting confused. They go into detail here on the effect of Java book. Again, we highly recommend that you pick up the copy of the book. There's tons of details in here, but that's the key thing here. Don't co- call overridable methods inside of your constructor. That's a big one. They also bring up a very important point here is that the clonable and serializable interfaces will present special difficulties when you actually design your class. Now, as they state here, it's generally not a good idea for a class to be designed for inheritance or implement either of these interfaces. Again, those are clonable or serializable as they place a substantial burden on programmers who extend the class. Now, there are, of course, special cases in which you can allow these subclasses to implement these interfaces without mandating the fact that they do so. And these are explained in item number 11 and item number 74, which we will eventually get to. Now, however, if you do decide to implement the clonable or serializable interface, um, you should be aware that those methods that they implement, which is clone and read object, uh, act a lot like constructors, and they have very similar restrictions. So neither clone nor read object, those are the methods, again, implemented by clonable and serializable, may invoke any overridable method directly or indirectly, again, because they act just like a type of constructor. And again, we can encounter all kinds of weird failures because of the order of operations, which happens when these methods are called. So again, this is a very short one here today. We're, we're talking about making sure that your your classes are documented properly. If you're building a class for inheritance, you want to make sure you're not calling any overridable methods in your constructor or inside of the clone method. If you're using clonable or read object, if you're using serializable, you want to make sure that if you're, you're testing your class. So implement a subclass of the class that you've just built, put that through a good test regimen, verify that in fact that you have the proper access modifiers on the overridable methods. And maybe if you don't need a method to be overridable, well then tighten it down a little bit. Now, again, we hope this helps stay in tune for future episodes here on Fragmented where we walk through the rest of the effective Java series. Thanks again for your time. We'll see you next time. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. 
Sarah the Amazing Jackson from The Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.